Kia ora, everybody. We're now officially live on Facebook. So we'll just get on this. So hopefully this gives our guests, oh, sorry, our watchers, our viewers, some time to go get, get a cup of tea, whatever they need to do. Are we live? We are live now. Here we go. Lovely. Oh, lovely. It's so strange seeing myself in live. I do not like it. <laughs> so let's wait a couple of moments. Oh. Okay, we are live now, Fano. Okay. Cool. And I'm just going to give a our Fano at home a couple of minutes to get online. Cool. And I will send the link to Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai ki te atia o Aotearoa Tua Whā, ko hauore te kaupapa o tēnei pō, tō tahi ki a timata me te karikia, me noi tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Well, kia ora koutou. welcome back to another Aotearoa Town Hall for your Monday evening. My name is Timothy Paul, and tonight the co-papa is Public Health and COVID-19. And for those who are frequent viewers, you'll notice that we that Thomas is not here to co-host tonight, but we have a special co-host. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, my name is Marlon Drake, North Tamaki Makoto Aho. Um, I'm a student, um, but I am also the regional organizer for the Living Wage Aotearoa. And I'm just ho hosting with Tam tonight just to jump in um, on behalf of my best mate, Thomas Nash, who is at home a bit busy tonight, unfortunately. I've also got my dog here, who hopefully he's not going to bark too loud during uh, tonight's live stream. Um, uh, so uh, a little bit about me back in, in terms of public health. Uh, back in 2018, I was the president of the Victoria University Wellness Student Association, and I helped um, help to lead a campaign around mental health for young people, specifically students in the Wellington region. And um, that's where my passion lies in terms of public health. But I'm really, really excited um, to be here tonight with, with this group. Um, and uh, yeah, Let, let's get started. Cool. Kia ora, Marlon. And for those who are new to Aotearoa Town Hall who might be tuning in to support a loved one or to hear from uh, one of your favourite um, people out there doing, doing the do, um, welcome to Aotearoa Town Hall. My name is Timata, as I said before. I'm a rangatahi Māori, a huri tēnei no Ngāti Awa, me Waikato Tainui, um, and I'm a councillor for Wellington City. Uh, with the climate change, youth and city safety portfolio. Um, so I'm really excited about tonight's corridor. Um, as I've said, the kaupapa is health. Um, and I'm really keen to hear all of the different perspectives around the uh, virtual tepu uh, this evening. Um, for me personally, I've been engaged with the public health system since I was 12 years old. Um, I was actually the youngest patient diagnosed in the Waikato with um, systemic lupus, erythematosus. So that's a autoimmune disease um, and I also have rheumatoid arthritis and a few other, um, I guess, conditions that go along with that. So it's been a good last decade um, interacting and engaging with the public health system as a young person, as a Māori person, and it's been a real journey for my whānau. And um, obviously I've been, been watching, uh, engaging with my doctors over this whole period to make sure that I'm being super duper careful and safe. Um, with my actions and, and, and looking after myself, which is why I'm so excited to hear the perspectives here tonight and how we can, um, you know, look at our public health system, look at the way that it's geared up, um, how it's geared up to deal with pandemics such as COVID-19, how can we make it stronger and how can we ensure that the people who need support are able to get it. Absolutely. Well, I have the honour of kicking us off tonight with our absolutely amazing panel, um, all of whom are actually doctors, except for Julianne Gender, who is just a minister, but she might not be a doctor, but she is honourable. So that's more than any of us can say. Um, we would also like to extend our sincerest apologies to Dr. Esther um, for accidentally leaving out your doctor title from the event um, signage and stuff that went out. But um, tonight we're going to refer to you only as Dr. Esther. So nothing else. We're going to make up for it. It's Dr. Esther, Dr. Esther. 
Um, we're going to get right into quick fire questions. Um, and each panelist, you, each you guys can also just introduce yourself and a little bit about you as well um, amongst those. But we're going to start off tonight with the incredible Dr. Susie Wiles, who I'm sure many of us have seen around the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, Susie, doc, sorry, Dr. Susie, why is it important that we get the communications and the messaging so right for COVID-19? And what kind of messaging do people respond well to? And what kind of messaging do people actually kind of switch off when they see? So really centering around messaging. Uh, kia ora, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Dr. Susie Wiles. I'm, um, I'm a microbiologist. I have a fascination with um, infectious microbes. I mainly study bacteria, but um, I can stretch myself to viruses when need be, <laughs> like in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I've run a research lab that studies um, bacteria, but I've also for the last 10 years or so um, been really interested in communication of science. Um, and so I've worked with artists and illustrators and all sorts of people to um, kind of learn to uh, how to communicate better, but also then to kind of communicate to different audiences and stuff. So I feel like in many ways, um, this pandemic came along and I've kind of been training for it for like 10 years. <laughs> um, and it's been an amazing kind of thing where I could sort of bring my science knowledge, but also my um, interest in communication together. Um, and so actually for during this pandemic, um, the spin-off cartoonist Toby Morris and I have been working together trying to um, take kind of uh, both kind of messages of how people need to behave, but also things around the science and explaining, um, you know, in kind of easy to use language and with awesome graphics care of Toby, um, yeah, what we need to do. So that's, so that's sort of what I've been doing and where I sit in the space. Um, and messaging is absolutely crucial. So one of the things that really struck me when, um, at the very beginning of the pandemic was um, this document was circulated, I think by the WHO, that talked about how to talk about COVID-19. And it was very clear about referring to, like, we shouldn't be referring to cases, we need to refer to people, and you have to be very clear about the language you use, so as not to stigmatize people. So it wasn't about people infecting other people, it was, you know, it was, it was really, it was really confronting, because everything that they said don't do, I have spent my entire career doing, um, as a way of trying to get people interested and excited about infectious diseases. And then I was like, holy shit. I have just been stigmatizing everybody my entire career. Oh my God. Um, so I, I had that, that document open on my computer all the time. And every time I wrote something, I went back and I was like, oh no, 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 I've got to rewrite that and stuff until it became kind of, you know, how, how I then started to naturally communicate. And the first time I heard the prime minister do um, one of her main speeches about it, she was using exactly the language that the document had said. And I was like, oh my God, she's read it, awesome. <laughs> And so it's been really clear here in New Zealand that the language, um, you know, the way that we've approached this has not been about being at war. I mean, she did mention war today, but it's one of the few times she's ever mentioned it. So lots of other countries are at war with the virus, and that puts you in a very negative frame. Um, it frames people who succumb to it as kind of having lost, um, and, it's, and it also frames those people who catch it as somehow the enemy and stuff. So she's been really clear and the whole country's been really clear that we're a team, you know, that this is a team effort, um, that we're united. And that kind of messaging is so important to try and stop um, stigma. So I'm really impressed with the way that uh, the campaign has gone here and the way that we've all acted together. Because as we're seeing played out in so many other countries, it is not going well in lots of places. Um, and I think that communication and clear communication um, right from the top has been absolutely crucial in getting everybody behind how we behave. And, you know, there are people who haven't behaved that way, but they have been in the minority. Um, and that, I think, has been absolutely astonishing. Oh, awesome. Kia ora, Susie, for that awesome kind of introduction to tonight's quarter all in terms of bringing that energy and those vibes. Um, I just was reading a comment that said that the Toby Morris, Susie Wiles graphics hand down the best science communication they had ever seen. And I also was just thinking um, Toby Morris has an excellent comic about Te Tiriti or Waitangi as well that is also available free online to people who want to explore um, some more of Toby's work on such an important kaupapa. And I think what you touched on in your corridor, Susie, about health literacy and people understanding these things and actually feeling compelled to follow the guidelines, I think is really important too. So thank you for that awesome introduction. Um, now we're moving on to Takuta Mataroria Linden. Atina Kwe Mataroria. Um, so my question for you tonight, uh, for your quick, 
quick fire question is that we have seen a lot about um, iwi roadblocks on the news over the last few weeks and you know you made it clear in our court or before this that this is that you know very minuscule in the scope of what iwi are actually doing so i was wondering if you could paint a picture of what that overall iwi response to COVID 19 has been like over the um, last few months I, uh, the iwi response uh, has been much more than uh, just checkpoints and that they aren't roadblocks, although that tends to be what the news has been uh, mostly highlighting. Uh, with my own iwi uh, in the north who have provided um, both the health and social response, uh, the importance of comms and also, uh, and also the cultural leadership as, as we've had to adapt as iwi, as whanau and hapu uh, to COVID-19, including the likes of uh, our tangihanga and our tikanga and our cultural protocols. And so I just want to highlight that uh, it's not just the the, uh, uh, the checkpoints, but rather my iwi Ngati Hine, um, who within the short space of only two weeks had to respond and provide um, over to over 800 whānau, the likes of a thousand kai packs, uh, welfare packs to, 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 to their iwi, uh, let alone uh, Te Kaho Tānui, the iwi collective across Northland who also provided uh, both a social response and housing uh, for Fano and Komatua in the north, and also all the other iwi who have also played a role. Um, I'm speaking because I have whakapapa to, to the north, um, but also my mahi in the north at Mahitahi Hoa, the, the primary healthcare organisation. Uh, and part of that response too has been uh, the health response. Um, so both iwi providers and Māori health providers um, doing uh, those community testing centres, running them, running them in a whānau order way, uh, in which it wasn't just about the test, uh, but rather if a whānau and uh, people would come forward, both Māori and non-Māori in their own communities, it wasn't just for the test, but also it may be for other health problems, uh, for kai packs, uh, social workers on site, whānau order navigators on site. So it was that ability of iwi and Māori health providers um, to be able to provide not only a more holistic response, but also to more meet the needs of their own community in comparison to you know, a broad brush, one size fits all national response. And part of that too um, was about the mobile outreach testing that they did. Uh, so the Māori health providers across the north um, doing all of the mobile testing, recognising that not all whānau uh, people in the community have the means, the transport, to be able to get to the testing centres in the main towns. And the Māori health providers have done over 800 COVID tests mobile uh, across over the last fortnight too. So that's some of the mahi um, that the Māori Health and the iwi providers uh, are doing. And, and some of that has also been related to um, the unity or the unified response called tahitanga uh, that's happened between iwi within the north, uh, between iwi uh, with our public sector agencies also in the north, both at the table, working in partnership, DHBs, primary health organisations, frontline clinicians, from the DHB, from Māori health providers, from the PHO, all working together as part of that response. And that's something that I want to see carry forward. It shouldn't have to take a, a, a pandemic um, to be able to break down and strengthen, um, break down those silent silos and strengthen those partnerships. Uh, and, and that's where iwi uh, and hapu are able to provide some of the best solutions to their own community that benefit not only Māori, uh, but also others across Northland within their own respective communities. <clears throat> That's really interesting. I think also considering what we've heard in the media as well, I'm, I'm sure everyone's seen um, that these the sort of roadblock checkpoint has become this dominant narrative and it's become like a And to hear from you um, what the, the, the full picture is of Iwi and Hapu support, I think is really, really important. And I think it's important that we step away from that kind of, you know, it's, is it good, is it bad? Well, actually, there's a whole picture here that we needs to be looked at. So I think really, really valuable there. Um, and, and not just that, the, the, the pandemic and um, how you mentioned it's, it's forced these groups to work together. Um, I think that's, that's really good too. Um, I don't know if, if I'm, I'm sure some of our viewers have seen the modelling reports that came out and there were some really stark worst case scenarios there um, for Māori and Pacific communities in particular. Um, and, and that leads quite nicely on to my next question for, or the next question for Dr. Rhys Jones. Um, I, I, I guess I'd say that we, we are in New Zealand that our government acted quickly. I think we can all agree on that. 
Um, but what kind of outcomes could we have expected? What kind of outcomes could we have seen if we would have, um, or for sorry, for for Maori and Pacific and other ethnic communities specifically, um, if our government had taken a response a bit more similar to the UK or the US um, or, or even or even Australia? Inga mihi nui kia koto katoa e te tuatahi kia koe e tam e te tuahine a e mihi nui kia koe mo tō karakia e faka tupere tō tato nei hui a e te pōna a kia koe hoki malam a e te te co-host a o te nei hui hui nga a kia koto hoki nga kai kōrero a koto hoki a o te ra huri no te motu kia ora a ko Rhys Jones tine he huri ahau no nga te kahangunu a no reira kā nui te nui kia koto uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Rhys, I'm a public health physician and um, senior lecturer at the University of Auckland working in Māori health and I, I have an interest in um, public health, health inequities, um, as well as environmental in influences on health and um, for quite some time I've also been involved as co-convener of Ora Taiao, the New Zealand Climate and Health Council, um, so I have a real interest in how um, health, equity, indigenous rights, uh, sustainability, all those things can um, actually complement each other and we can work together towards a um, healthier, um, more equitable, more resilient um, yeah, and more inclusive future for Aotearoa. Um, I'm also actually in the current context part of um, a group called Te Ropu Whakakaupapa Uruta, which is the National Māori Pandemic Response Group, and um, have been learning a lot about uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic along the way through uh, interacting with that group. Um, in terms of, yeah, what kind of outcomes could we have seen had we not acted so decisively? Uh, could have been really devastating, as you say, for Māori and Pacific communities. Um, partly that is due to a greater risk of transmission. So, you know, we know Māori Pacific communities especially are uh, more likely to live in crowded housing conditions, more likely to have intergenerational households where the risk of transmission could um, affect those who are more likely to suffer more serious outcomes um, from the coronavirus. Um, we, we know also, and I think Marlon has already alluded to this, that for people who get infected, um, who get COVID-19, the outcomes are much worse for um, Māori and Pacific peoples. We've, we've seen um, modelling studies, which I think you're referring to from um, Te Pūnaha Matatini, which show that um, Māori who, who contract um, COVID-19 are between one and a half and two and a half times as likely to die from the illness as non-Māori. And so, you've got a situation where it's the same virus, but it's like it's twice as lethal amongst Māori communities. Um, and even that is likely to be an underestimate of the true inequity. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of other factors to do with racism in the health system and other, other um, inequities that aren't even accounted for in that. So we're likely to see Māori um, and Pacific communities and, and lots of other communities um, more seriously affected by um, COVID-19 um, as well as a lot of the non-COVID-19 outcomes, you know, if our health system had become overwhelmed, um, we would have seen the inequities that already exist in our health system being exacerbated um, with poorer access, poorer quality of care for Māori and Pacific. Um, and the other point I just wanted to make is that um, while I said before that it could have been devastating for Māori and Pacific and other communities, in fact, it could still be, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, once restrictions are starting to be relaxed, you know, things are starting to open up, we could easily get a second wave of the virus. Um, so we can't let our guard down now and we need to really be factoring that in, protecting our most vulnerable communities for some time to come. Order. Koe, Dr. Reese, thank you. And um, especially important that point that you said about, um, I guess, reinforcing or uh, I guess entrenching more, more reinforcing existing health um, inequities. So thank you for bringing um, light to that. And and speaking of those existing inequities, I wanted to move to inequities that exist for disabled people, um, and bring in Dr. Esther here. So, um, tēnā koe, Dr. Esther. So my 
uh, Pātai for you, and also please do feel free to do an introduction that is more befitting of your enormous um, work that you have done and contributed uh, for everybody, but um, on behalf of the disabled community, community. So you have been an outspoken advocate on behalf of disabled people. And one topic in particular um, was is around housing. And um, I just wanted to know if you would be able to share a bit about how the lockdown experience in terms of being stuck at home um, has been for people with disabilities and what that experience, um, this whole experience has been like. Um, kia ora. Um, tuna koutou, and thank you so much for um, having me on the panel. It's really exciting. Thank you to Tam and Marlon for um, hosting tonight and also for to, to Thomas for like setting up this really exciting um, discussions, all of these panels and Koda, it's really awesome. Um, so I'm Esther, um, I'm from Tupanganua Tata, I'm from Wellington. Um, I am uh, Pākehā and um, Huda, which is a, um, I learned quite recently, it's um, Jewish, it's um, uh, Tata for Jewish. Um, I'm a disabled researcher um, and a advisor and advocate um, I've sort of come from a, a disabled person-led organisation background um, and disabled person-led research background. Um, I did my uh, studies on uh, disability and public health around sort of social participation um, and I've got particular, um, I suppose, interests in, as many of our other speakers do, around um, inequities. Um, so sort of like the overwhelming kind of the disproportionate um, experience of dis disabled people being in poverty and um, being um, part of our um, justice system, being prisoners, um, sort of um, inequities in educational access as well as um, achievement for disabled people um, and, uh, you know, the incredibly high rates of sort of unemployment. So there's a lot of... Um, there's huge amounts of um, social inequity for disabled people. Um, and so I guess I'm really interested in how those, the social participation and those inequities work. Um, I'm also working at the um, Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse and Care. And of course there's been um, huge amounts of Māori going through the state care system, um, but there's also been um, a long history of disabled people being um, institutionalized and uh, kept um, from society, um, both sort of historically and also a sort of segregation that we see um, for disabled people today. So I'm very excited to be part of it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about housing um, and your question about sort of how the the um, lockdown has affected disabled people. I think it's um, this kind of that big picture how it's affected disabled people, um, which is, you know, um, obviously some, but not all disabled people have, um, also have health conditions, which make them particularly susceptible to um, uh, becoming seriously ill and dying um, because of um, COVID um, and other kind of, you know, um, viruses. Um, but I suppose in terms of housing, the concern for that, uh, the concern around that really for me is that um, disabled people are also more likely to live in cold, damp housing. So, um, and that's really um, usually due to poverty. And um, as, as I said, there's like a huge, huge rates of poverty in the disability community. Um, but I suppose for some people, there's kind of more technical aspects to their housing needs. Um, so some people may need particular kind of access to their um, access to in and out of their housing, access through their house. Um, I think that um, you know one of the things that worries me is that some people's um, very very basic needs not being met during the lockdown. Um, I you know I've heard of so many people who haven't been able to, um, just generally speaking, before the lockdown, not being able to shower at home having to go to like local pools to shower. I've got a good friend, Erin, shout out to Erin, who's probably watching, who's talked kind of publicly quite a lot about having to, um, before she moved into a current house, having to shower at her workplace. 
and um, because they there's just not they um there's just not accessible housing there's not enough accessible housing um and that's kind of like a huge issue in itself but it's also um um an intersectional issue because we also have um much higher rates of disability among Māori among among Pacifica and um, so there's often a lot of compounding factors when it comes to um, issues of housing. Um, and I suppose um, another thing is, is about how housing is really both about keeping us safe when we're at home, but also about connecting us to our community. Um, and um, so I suppose there's sort of concerns about people still being able to access healthcare and um, being able to kind of get the services. And at the moment, transport isn't really an issue, which is, um, because um, we haven't really been encouraged to be um, obviously going out into the world um, which is which is kind of weird because in some ways and I've definitely heard this a lot some disabled people are actually feeling that they are less disabled at the moment they're, if they're if they're work, able to work from home they might be able to call in they might be able to kind of work from home work on their computer um, and they don't have to worry about sort of inaccessible transport they don't have to worry about and accessible working environments and that kind of stuff. So I think it's really been um, a mixed bag in terms of um, people's physical environments and, um, and disability. Yeah, but uh, it's a it's a it's a kind of big it's a it's a huge community with a lot of varied experiences. So I guess some sort of commonalities around um, heaps of barriers in society that disabled people face. That's, that's really interesting, Esther. Thank, thank you for that. I think it's a really, really unique um, uh, a, a perspective there, um, especially around the working from home and looking at the things that have been uh, introduced now that maybe yeah. should stay beyond <laughs> you know, beyond COVID. Maybe we should actually learn from learn some of these lessons um, that, from people's experiences during uh, the level four and level three, three lockdowns. Um, uh, I, 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 well, kind of on that that vein of, of, of lessons and what we can learn, I, I wanted to, to bring in um, Minister Julian Genta. Um, obviously, you've got a, another really unique perspective, sort of seeing things from from the top, I imagine, um, and, and getting a bit of a bird's eye view. But I guess what I wanted to ask you was, as the Associate Minister of Health, um, what do you think the biggest lessons that we've learned uh, in facing the current pandemic? And um, what, what, what are the lessons that have been learned by the government, um, by DHBs, primary health care, but also just um, out of curiosity for politicians too um, in, in this context? Tana koutou katoa. It's a real privilege to join this forum tonight with all these illustrious doctors. Um, and thank you. And the fantastic hosts, um, Marlon and Tam, and uh, of course, Thomas isn't here. Um, so, uh, uh, co Julianne Genter, aho. I'm um, Julianne Genter, and I'm an MP for the Green Party. I've been a politician for almost nine years, which um, was quite kind of a surprise in my life. And I've been Associate Minister of Health and Transport and Minister for Women for um, two and a bit years, um, and a mother for um, 20, 21 months now. <laughs> Uh, which is definitely the hardest job yet, but also the most wonderful. Um, so I might slightly cheat in responding to your question because um, firstly, I would say from my point of view, uh, what we've all learned is something that I've felt very strongly and which motivated me to get involved in politics, which is we are really all in this together. Hey, waka eka noa. Um, you know, in the world, uh, humans can't do things without affecting others and without it being affected by and affecting our natural environment. And I'm at, I'm at once a pessimist and an optimist. Um, I can see very clearly that we have a lot of big challenges. And I guess I got involved in politics because I'm really optimistic that working together, we can solve those challenges. We can respect people, we can respect our planet and we can make a more equitable world. And that's just been reinforced, I suppose, by the response I've seen to COVID-19 here in Aotearoa, but also globally, that um, when we're faced with this really obvious common challenge, we do have the ability to work together. And um, our health system, one of the lessons I think we've definitely learned is it's very important to invest in public health. Uh, which is something that I've believed um, as long as I've been the health spokesperson for the Green Party and before that. But, um, you know, I think that 
there were some definite gaps that were shown up in our health system because public health uh, wasn't a big focus of uh, previous regimes. And uh, we were a bit catching up in some respects because of that. I think that when it came time to respond to the crisis and it came to things like um, PPE distribution, um, it was pretty obvious that having a really decentralized system posed some challenges. And I think it, we were able to uh, eventually fix it, but it, there was no question that in the beginning, it was really hard to make sure that the PPE was getting to everyone who needed it when they needed it. Um, and I'd also say as Minister for Women, I think one of the things that has been made clear by this COVID-19 challenge is that so many of our essential workers are women and a lot of them are, are not on particularly high wages. So um, I recently shared on uh, my Facebook page some graphs that the Ministry for Women and put together and it showed like an astonishing percentage of our frontline healthcare workers are women. Um, the majority of supermarket checkout workers are women. The majority of um, retail and accommodation workers are women. Um, and, uh, and in all of those areas, um, in, in some cases uh, for our health workers, this is really clear, um, because they've been in a predominantly female um, workforce that they've actually been undervalued over time. So I think it's just shown that um, some of the things that are most essential to making sure that people have what they need um, haven't been valued as highly as some other professions say. And uh, in our response, in our economic response, it's very important to me uh, that we try to address those inequities and try to make sure that the most vulnerable people um, are at the heart of our recovery. Well, kia ora. Um, thank you for that one, Julianne. And um, I just wanted to, before we jump to our more um, detailed questions, I just wanted to ask two questions that we've just gotten in from the live stream. And I thought I'd better ask them since Julia Faiporti's asked them because she, thanks to her, we were able to get the awesome Dr. Esther on the show. So kia ora, Julia. Um, and the question is actually around today's announcements at 4 p.m. And I'm going to ask, um, put it to Dr. Matarudia and Dr. Rees first, and then follow this with um, Minister Julianne. I feel so formal with these titles. Um, and it is that we would like, the, the people at home want to know, why is it that Tangihanga remain at 10 people, but so do cafes and restaurants? And why can't we assign our own tikanga for tangihanga or is anything going on in the background to, to tie the two things together and to allow Māori to self-determine what is and won't work for our cultural practices such as tangihanga? Kia for that part, I did see the um, announcements today about level two and, and level two is much more than just level three with a haircut. Uh, it goes a lot of the way towards um, the um, relaunching the, the economy, uh, schools reopening, um, but also um, goes to show about the issues that continue around our, our tangihanga and our practices. One of the key things that come up from Te Kahu Tonui and the Iwi Leads uh, within Te Taitukira, within Northland, um, is about um, the lack of engagement and the lack of partnership at the ministry level uh, around the development of such guidelines. Um, that have a huge impact on Māori communities, particularly in terms of the practices, cultural practices, such as tangihanga, which are a key part of marae, hapu, whānau, and iwi life. Uh, and I acknowledge that that's also, um, those kind of practices are also for other communities like Pacifica and other cultural groups too. And the interesting thing that was in my head today was how you could go to a movie theatre uh, and uh, go watch a movie, but you still can't have more than 10 people attend, attend a tangi or a funeral. And so I do think, um, you know, uh, Reese's work and also Te Ropu, uh, te, the Māori pan Pandemic Response Group, Te Ropu Uruta, have also highlighted these issues uh, for a long time now. And this is a kaupapa that I did want to discuss tonight, particularly uh, as we delve in deeper into the to the next questions about what, what a, a response might look like in future. And part of that is about the, the greater engagement, the greater partnerships uh, with iwi uh, when it comes to such policies as, as tangihanga policies. Um, Within the north, uh, among the iwi such as Ngāti Hine, uh, we've also had these specific um, discussions about how we can implement our tikanga, our, our tangihanga protocols during COVID. 
um, thinking about um, not only our career in Komatua and the role that they have on the marae, but they're also a, a vulnerable group um, to COVID. Thinking about how we can do our tikanga safely, which I believe we can, around uh, hand hygiene and social distancing that can happen on them. And I'm thinking about our whareikai processes. And so I agree that it is an important kopa to highlight because of, of how the arbitrary number of 10 people uh, might come about and how it hasn't necessarily involved iwi as part of that decision-making. Oh, kia ora, Matororia. Um, ai, tautoko tēnā kōrero. Um, I'd, I'd probably just add that um, I, I think, you know, this magical number of 10, um, the rationale that the Prime Minister gave today for, you know, having that number in a lot of different settings is around contact tracing and the ability to, um, you know, have a manageable number that you then need to trace all the contacts of um, should anything go wrong. And so I think, you know, there's that rationale, but then I think on the other hand, we do need to be uh, thinking about how we can um, trust iwi, hapu, uh, marae, communities, other uh, Māori groups organising hui to, to be able to um, manage that themselves. You know, we, we've shown that we're very good at adapting tikanga, adapting practices uh, to be able to manage those sorts of risks. So I think, I think there is an element where, um, sure, you know, we need to have some limits around the number of people congregating in, in a number of different situations. Um, but there are particular contexts, such as Tangihanga might be one example. Um, I know over the course of Level 4 and Level 3 lockdown, there's been a real, you know, mamai, a real um, sacrifice made by Fano, uh, and everyone's kind of been thinking that, or perhaps by the time we get to Level 2, we'll be able to have Tangihanga funerals. Uh, we'll be able to celebrate our whānau's life in, in something like, more like the normal way we would do things. Um, but, you know, obviously that's not the case at this point, um, but we need to look at how that can be, you know, perhaps uh, negotiated as we move forward from here. Susie, so, 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 put a hand up. <laughs> yeah, can, can I jump in here? Because, um, so can I maybe explain the context around why a cinema but not a tangi? Because it might also be helpful for you to have some information to then figure out how to respond. So the things that are really risky are um, other close contact, other hugs and things like that, but there are also singing and talking um, and shouting and things like that. So things that are sort of gonna generate um, these sort of, you know, uh, if you are infected, then are gonna spread the virus. And so when you're at a cinema, um, appropriately spaced out, nobody's really talking or singing or anything, you're just watching a screen. So the so the so the, the chance of a transmission event happening are much much smaller than if you're at a gathering where people are joyous and or sad or you know so they'd be the same with the wedding and everything where people are interacting in a way where their voices are raised where there's a chance of um, of this droplet transmission and so it, when thinking then about how you would mitigate that transmission that's the thing that needs to be thought about not necessarily the you can have these people in a cinema, but not this, you know, these people doing this. It's because of what is being done and what the risks of transmission are. So that's the context behind it. That um, That's why church services are the same, because when we're bringing people together and they are singing and they are, you know, um, the, these kinds of things that generate droplets, it's quite different to um, being sat. Uh, at least I've not really been to a cinema where everybody's yelling at the screen unless it was a Rocky Horror Picture Show or something like that. But you know, there's, so that's the context behind it. And that's the thing I think that needs to be um, brought in. What are the practices then that could be, um, that could be developed to help minimize those risks of transmission? Awesome, did anyone else want to add anything? Did you want to add anything onto that Minister Julianne? Or, oh, cool, sweet as. So, and I'm going to, before we move on to our more substantial questions, um, I just wanted to ask one more from the audience, and that one's for you, Dr. Susie. And it is in response to your tweet today about how you would have preferred to stay in level three for a bit longer. Could you just uh, give us a quick little rundown of what you meant about that and what your kind of best worst outcome scenarios are around that? Yeah, so because this virus has an incubation period of about two to 10 days, we were kind of running on what we call essentially a two week cycle. 
So when we got down to zero cases, that was a reflection of, uh, of a lack of infections over the last two week period, which was back in level four. So what we've seen is that the level four worked very, very, very well. But we are today only two weeks away from when we entered level three. And so my feeling is that we haven't quite had enough days to know whether level three has actually worked and whether that easing of restrictions hasn't started to see some transmission happening um, that basically we wouldn't see for another week or so. So that was my reluctance was if we, we, if we move down slowly, then we will see the impact of our actions from two weeks ago, and then that gives us confidence to move. So we know that when that lots of people got very excited about level three, and there were uh, there was a bit of behaviour certainly in that first in the first few days of you know not quite getting it right. And so what I wanted to see was that hadn't done that hadn't triggered any more transmission change that we basically wouldn't see the results of for another week or so. But, you know, obviously the government's had to be pragmatic, right? I mean, there's been a lot, this has done lots of damage and what they're trying to balance is us not ending up back in level four with what can we do safely? So the thing, so while I would have liked another week, because that, that would have got us through the another cycle that would have got us to the stage where if the numbers were starting to rise, we would see it. So they've done instead a more staggered approach, which I think is the right one. So again, they've gone on this. So what are the risks and which ones can we open up a little bit more, keeping the riskier things for kind of a week's time? Again, when we would start to see whether those numbers were changing. And the problem is we have seen this happen everywhere. So, you know, and if, I guess it's a slightly fortunate for us that Korea's just now had this sort of thing where now they've had to contact trace 1500 people just from one person's actions because they opened up the bars you know it's happening in all sorts of places but it's also just happened in Australia so in Melbourne they um, uh, have had some kind of quite low numbers and then they've ended up with one workplace which um, just in a few days went from zero to 75 cases uh, and so my worry then is what happens in a week's time when all of those transmissions that we you know that weren't known about before those 75 cases have happened so that's why I was wanting it to be slower um, because of what we've seen overseas and that worry that because what we see now is, a, is, an, uh, is basically what happened a week to two weeks ago, that um, it might get out of hand before we know it. So that's just, yeah, I'm worried. <laughs> I must say I'm worried. Um, yeah, so I just hope that we all, I mean, it's, it's on us now. So it's all how we behave and, and also how quickly, if anybody has any symptoms that they get tested because it's now, the test, track and isolate is our main, how we stamp out any existing transmission chains. And so that's why, you know, all of the initiatives around expanding contact tracing, but also making sure that testing is accessible to everybody who needs it. And then everybody who has a hint that they need it has to sort of ask for it. And, and then hopefully we'll be able to stamp out anything. Hopefully it's fine and we won't see anything, but ooh, fingers crossed. <laughs> Kia ora, Susie. Um, th thank you for that. And fingers crossed indeed. And um, uh, very much, very happy to plea, uh, very pleased, sorry, to move now on to the substantial que questions. Um, so I really encourage the, the panel to just jump in if you feel like you want to add something um, to, to, to these questions. Um, and the first one is actually for Dr. Susie Wiles. Um, so and I think it's fitting as well. It leads really nicely on from, from that corridor. Um, and that is just what are the what are the, the critical factors that um, for us here in Aotearoa to, to be able to overcome COVID-19? And, and how do you think that those factors will change us as a country, as a nation um, for, forever? Yeah, Possibly. well, I guess the thing, so the thing about health, I mean, one, so I'm from the UK, I'm, as I say, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated by bacteria. And when I was thinking about what I would um, uh, study when I moved here, I started having a look and um, our rates of infectious diseases are astonishingly high. I mean, I was I was kind of gobsmacked having, uh, I mean, I married a Kiwi, I come over on holiday every sort of year or so or every other year and just to find out that there was the side of New Zealand that I had no idea about as a tourist. Um, and that ended up being the things that I was studying. So Staph aureus, um, strep pyogenes, which causes rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. So we have these uh, things that just shouldn't exist here. And they are absolutely inequities, right? They are utterly to do with, um, with everything, with income inequality, with bad housing, with, um, you know, t access, both, you know, racism in the health system and, and access to healthcare. 
um, and I was I was shocked and and shocked that um, that you know it's, it's also really clear I guess that these things have been rising over time with decisions that have been made in politics and other things you know that as income inequality has widened so has the how, so have these things risen um, and that that, that this this like nothing's been done to stop it like they, they haven't been getting any better I guess um, and so. It was, you know, the 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 research from TPM to Puna Haimatatini about the modeling around, well, who are our vulnerable patients? Although I kind of that's a horrible word to say, but who, you know, who are the people who no um, reason of their, you know, no, no fault of their own, who would be badly affected by this virus? And it was it was all the people who every other thing is plonked on all over already. So um, it was also why I was really appalled by the idea that we would ever do anything other than try to eliminate the virus. Like this idea that any country anywhere should be allowing a virus they don't know anything about to basically run through a population while protecting the vulnerable. I mean, that's just, it's a it's a complete misunderstanding of who is vulnerable and how you could protect them as though they can be put in a box somewhere and aren't actually a functioning part of society when I mean, it's just it's so offensive on so many levels so there's all of this stuff around COVID-19 that is everybody has known about and it's just it's just shone such a bright light on them now I guess I mean we can see this also now from the cases in the UK and the US who are the people who are dying they are those essential workers who are more exposed, you know, because all the white rich people can sit at home and not be exposed and can work and, you know, can stay out of harm's way. And it's all right saying to them, yes, open up our economy when they're not the ones at risk. So it's just, it has shone this huge light that we always knew existed. And I guess the question now is what are we going to do about that? Like, it's just so unacceptable that it should have been allowed to get to the stage globally. Um, and then, you know, we've, what we have seen, I guess, from this pandemic is that is how quickly change can be made, how quickly everybody can work from home. And although, you know, um, with the caveat that we're, we're not actually working from home, we're at home during a crisis trying to work kind of thing. But, you know, it's, it's just shown that we can make change when change needs to be made and it can be made really fast. So what are the things that we would do now? you know, to prevent this from happening again, because it's very clear that um, we will get another pandemic at some stage, uh, whether it's in five years time or 10 years time or 20 years time, who knows, but it will happen again. And so now we know what we know, how would we prevent this from happening again? How would we ensure that everybody, you know, had that, it, that, that yeah, we didn't have the number of vulnerable people. I mean, it's just, you know, it, oh, ah, it makes me kind of like that. It makes me rage, rageful, if that's a word. Um, but I just would hope that, you know, we've we've learned lots of things about our health system that we kind of knew. I mean, we knew that we couldn't let this go through because we didn't have enough beds and we didn't have enough ventilators and all of these kinds of things. Um, and so the question now is, what do we do with that information? And how could we ever go back to a situation where, uh, where you know, where people who were left to be vulnerable, I guess, is that a bit rambly? Sorry. Um, that's kind of how I feel. It's just, it's, it's stuff we knew about, but there have been reviews and papers and experts have said for years and years is now out in the open for everybody to see. And so the question is, how do we move from here in a way that does not just replicate this for the next pandemic that we experience? Mm, very powerful words. And I think, you know, the kind of that was very easy to follow because it's the logical thought patterns that I think a lot of us have been experiencing. Like, if this happens, then surely this will happen. And then, you know, just so totally total what you're saying. And actually, I think um, the best way that we can improve is by centering the experiences of people most um, most affected by uh, the lockdown and just generally screwed by the system. Like, if, we, if we're going to just call a spade a spade. Um, and uh, I know from my experiences that you know our system and, our, and the way that our world is set up is not friendly to people with disabilities it's not it's not accessible in any way and that's why i wanted to bring you in dr esther to ask you we're talking about you know we need to we need to make sure that the way that we recover or regenerate is in a way that centers um, the experiences of people who have been you know disadvantaged this whole time and we've really just had a magnifying glass held up to that over the last few months so how can the government 
in society, I guess, recover in a way which centers the experiences of disabled people? Um, you know, what, what are the kind of key areas within our society that need that needs a real, you know, mahi or work done to, to make them inclusive and accessible, accessible for all? And if you want to maybe um, touch on some of the things you might hope to see in the budget, uh, over the next week or so and you know some things some things that might create some opportunities or purposeful mahi for people with uh, disabled people sorry yeah um yeah thank you so much Susie like it's it's awesome I was just like going yep 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 about all of the things you're saying um and I think what's so important is like you know we're talking a lot about the like replication of viruses but actually what we're seeing is the replication of injustice and that's like something that we can't afford to see and we actually have to like we have to like uh act urgently to um change some of the stuff um I, I i thought your question was really interesting cam around centering the experiences of disabled people and um, i think i mean personally i'm like it's not even usually about centering the experiences of disabled people it's just about acknowledging the experiences of disabled people um, that disabled people um, are both um, people in our society um, who have, you know, needs as everyone else does. Um, uh, but actually, that when you when you kind of often when you ignore the the needs of disabled people, um, when you're creating kind of policies and that includes like the budget and that kind of stuff, then yeah, you're just doubled. You're doubling down on all of the um, inequity and all of the injustice, and 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 you're disabling people further. You know, and I I love the social model of disability for like you know, ex, you know, talking about these issues. It's like it's the it's the choices that we make as and as as a society that disable people. You know, we can choose to build houses that are accessible. We can choose to kind of make education accessible for all students and um, we can choose to kind of you know make sure that people get the support that they need that um that our transport works for everyone that all of our systems kind of actually work for everyone so i think it's not really about centering disabled people but just not about leaving disabled people behind um and so not i think one of the issues is that um, you know, often when I look at sort of these systems and these policies and that kind of stuff, um, disability is usually like the, oh, oh shit, excuse my language, we forgot about disabled people. So it's like, oh, we'll just do an extra bit. Um, and the problem is, is that disabled people are disabled by the systems, not by like, not, you know, not by, you can't just kind of at the last minute kind of go, uh, we'll just we'll just tack this thing on because a it doesn't usually work and b it's always more expensive and more complicated and 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 it doesn't really work for people when you do that um and I think I think the other the really interesting thing is and even talking about disability is quite complicated because it it means a lot of things and it looks like a lot of things and um, you know um and you know it's such a wide range of experience within disability you've got different kinds of impairments you've got physical impairments you've got um you know you know sensory impairments you let people who can't who won't be able to see this um this live stream people who won't be able to access it all because they speak new zealand sign language and um, you know um and we want to kind of like show that really we're we need to make sure that it's acknowledged that it's really really diverse and we really are spread out through society and um, i think it's really interesting you know i i work with and i'm friends with and i, I this is you know i'm really part of a lot of like some disability communities but it wasn't until the the kind of COVID arrived that everyone you start hearing about people being like oh, i'm actually immune compromised and i'm immune compromised and and actually my husband's immune compromised, my parents are immune compromised and, and you know, like, and when you think about, you know, what what we're hearing about, you know, it's not just um, older people and people with health conditions who, who, who are dying, but it's actually the healthcare workers. It's, you have to, when you're protecting like 
people with um, vulnerable people with like compromised immunity with poor health you're actually protecting the whole of society um, and I think that it's just about kind of like making sure that we have that um, that protect, yeah protecting everyone is about is how you protect the whole community um, and I think but I think one of those like examples of kind of leaving disabled people behind is and um, you know we've, we've had assurances that people will be able to get their hair cut and like trust me I'm very excited about you know being able to get my hair cut at some point in the future and um, probably not for a while because I'm going to be staying at home pretty much under level two still but um you know and um, we've had assurances from the government that there'll be guidance for hairdressers and there'll be support if people can't if hairdressers can't access PPE to keep themselves safe, masks, gloves, that kind of stuff. But, you know, a lot of disabled people who have people coming into their homes to help them with, you know, basic, um, you know, you know, daily life activities um, who have, who might have really compromised immune systems. And there, there's been like, it's been incredibly, um, it was very slow to get any advice and to get access to PPE and you know and it's been quite inequal and I know that um Minister Jean just talked about you know like part of the issue is that a lot of these systems are really devolved so like this DHB might have been really good to like distribute PPE to people in the community but others haven't and um you know um and even in terms of just like um prioritizing you know advice and and guidance kind of thing. I mean, um, the advice went up in the Ministry of Health on Friday for disabled people who have carers coming into their home. That was three days ago. You know, we're talking about getting advice for hairdressers in the next few days so that people can get their hair cut. You know, when obviously everyone like cares about that stuff, but actually it's life and death when it comes to like, you know, vulnerable people in their home who cannot go without support um, so yeah I think I think again it's that thing it's not necessarily about centering disabled people it's about like just like being aware including disabled people in these conversations um, and I so many people in the disability community have been working their ass off for the last month and a half to like make sure that systems work so that um, communications are getting out there um, but I think that we're really starting from a long way back um, in terms of kind of like getting systems ready. Um, and I think that's always true. Um, and, and I've done some, some rather research in the past around preparing like around the Christchurch earthquake and stuff like that. And people who have resources, people who have um, connections and who have networks and have you know all these people around them to kind of like jump in when when something terrible happens they usually they usually they usually get through um but uh, like some disabled people are like super isolated um they don't have they can be disconnected from family they really almost um <laughs> almost entirely this huge amount of like um policy and um, and so people just don't have the any cushion they don't have any any resources to kind of feel like you know I can I can I can this is what I can do to get through these systems so I think it's about um and I guess that's what I would love to see from the budget is that so many um I think a lot of disabled people are really living on the edge you know and 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 that's in terms of like housing it's in terms of like um any kind of income like food transport healthcare all this kind of stuff that I would like to see um you know and we have as a country done that partially around um uh you know for older people around having you know superannuation and that kind of stuff um and I think that particularly for disabled people who um work doesn't work for essentially you know and I've been really lucky and in a way that's kind of one of the reasons why I have a PhD because I had to keep on studying until I was qualified enough to be able to get jobs because um, physically there was a, um, I wasn't going to be able to do a lot of work so um, and I've been incredibly fortunate um, with the awesome work that I've done but I think that um, you know 
um, you can do heaps of stuff to make work more accessible, including um, letting people work from home or letting them work from home some of the time. You can um, you can kind of you can change these things and you can change them really quickly. Um, you can make sure that people have the technology that they need or maybe the support that they need to be able to work and that kind of stuff, which is really important for people's, um, you know, mental well-being as well as their um, financial well-being. Um, but I think as well that some people, um, some people are just like never going to be the kind of um, the productive capitalist worker that our economy the idea our economy is kind of based on this idea um and um and so i think what i, I mean what i would personally love to see is that people have the resources that they need they have all of their basic needs met um separate from their ability to um um contribute to society and contribute to workplaces and contribute to their community um yeah i think I think that would be my dream for the economy. Um, otherwise, I suppose, it, you know, apart from anything else, what worries me about things like this pandemic is, um, you know, skyrocketing, if we have skyrocketing rates of, of any kind of economic downturn, unemployment or anything like that, um, I think that I, I fear that disabled people might be the most vulnerable um, workers. Um, and just the most vulnerable, you know, in terms of, as they often are, in terms of accessing housing, accessing healthcare, and being able to afford um, things. So yeah, I guess, I guess, um, creating more equity in society generally is always going to help disabled people. <laughs> I could I could go on for <laughs> many hours, but um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Esther. I really, really appreciate that. And I think um, what you've touched on there, I'm seeing a lot of really positive support in the comments as well for people who are acknowledging that um, that the, the key message there is that actually, um, on the one hand, it's very good for us to be very happy with the with the, with the with the response. And overall, you know, we can we can look at general, we can be very excited about a haircut. I certainly need one. Um, but the but really, we don't we can't be leaving people behind. Uh, we can't be leaving people out of the conversation as well um and i think that that, that really came through in um in your core um so thinking about dr s's um core just then and then also earlier susie as well i've been called dr Esther so much in my life by the way oh, that's gonna keep going. we're not gonna stop <laughs> okay, um, cool. uh and, and then also thinking about um dr susie's uh uh acknowledgement that we will have another pandemic. My next question for you, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Um, Mataroria, is um, how can we prepare for another pandemic? So this is a big question. <laughs> um, how can we better prepare for, for another pandemic such as COVID-19 happening in the future? Um, but uh, more importantly, how can we entrench a pandemic response that centers tikanga Māori and, and rongo Māori uh, responses as a part of that, 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 that pandemic? plan or response? Good. Well, firstly, I, I to talk on echo Susie's and Esther's comments uh, about equity and about pre-COVID and the situation that we have around the differential access to healthcare, differential access to services among Māori, among dis disabled people, among other communities. And, you know, those disparities in terms of the social determinants of health, like um, housing, employment, education, income, we're there and it, and it only perpetuates itself when, we, when it comes to pandemics. Uh, and so it's no surprise when Susie comes to New Zealand uh, that we still have um, conditions such as rheumatic fever uh, prevalent among Māori and Pacific communities because those social determinants of health haven't been addressed and there's still a long way to go as, as, as Ju Ju Julianne will speak to as well around the government response to increasing uh, access to housing, increasing uh, income and all the other initiatives that they're doing too. So first just echo and acknowledge um, the comments around the need to address social determinants and the focus on equity and one of those things for a future pandemic it's, it's easy to look back uh, in terms of where we are currently and we're not out of the woods yet as Reese says but to look back and um, and look at the areas that can be uh, improved upon um, in hindsight and part of that is having a, a, a pandemic response uh, that is grounded in equity that is grounded in tititi and kopapa Māori 
uh, response uh, for Māori communities. And equity looks at uh, the, the, the differential approaches and the different resources that need uh, to, 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 be, to be had, to be created, to be enabled, um, so that different communities are able to uh, have their own responses and then determine their own outcomes. And I think if we, if we look at that as a focus, not just the lens, but a focus for future pandemics, we'll be able to address uh, more quickly um, some of the issues that we've had in terms of this current um, pandemic response. Uh, and so th thinking about equity, but also thinking about what you highlight, uh, which I'd call a kaupapa Māori approach um, to a pandemic response, is some of the mahi that te ropu upa, upa, uruta and Rees and, uh, and other Māori health uh, public health physicians have been uh, calling for, but also what we're seeing in the iwi response uh, into Taitokiro in Northland too, in terms of recognising uh, that it's actually not just about a COVID test or a flu jab, but there's a whole heap of other factors that influence on one's health. Health influences and impacts on the economy, and the economy also impacts on health too. And at a whānau level, uh, it's having iwi, at the table, Fano Hapu as part of that response, working in partnership under a utility framework, which includes equity uh, within that. And we've seen issues such as our, our tangihanga protocols, etc., where that hasn't has not been considered. Uh, but as part of the future response plan, acknowledging the social determinants, uh, acknowledging the need, as Julianne mentions, for the investment in public health. Uh, which will be a good start because as we've seen from other reports, such as the Global Health Security Index, uh, you know, which, rate, which ranked uh, New Zealand 36th out of uh, 60 high income countries in terms of our pandemic readiness in the first place, we saw uh, 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 Dr. Beryl's um, evaluation and report into our level of contact tracing capability which acknowledge that public health units are, are under-resourced to, to do that mahi. And that's been a long period of a lack of investment in public health, whether that be uh, pandemic responses, but also addressing those broader social terms of health and thinking about the likes of um, health promotion and other areas of public health um, that, that haven't had that investment compared to uh, hospital and secondary care type services, for example. Um, so thinking about the future pandemic response, it's about addressing those social determinants. It's about being whanau centered and taking a tertiary and an equity approach. Um, and it's also about um, that investment in public health in, in which we'll, we'll, be be, we'll be better prepared in future. And you know, to, to get into some of those details, when I was, um, you know, in terms of the response in the North, issues around even PPE, like just nobody knew where the supply is coming from. Even the flu vaccines, there's an ongoing issue around, around both the distribution the supply channel and the equity of the distribution or the maldistribution of the flu vaccines within our community. So there's a whole heap of areas which I think will, will come out uh, as we look back and evaluate our, our pandemic response, uh, but those are some of the key areas that I've highlighted. And I just also want to highlight um, too about the unmet need that's growing and, and increasing uh, within healthcare. And one of the things why I'm, I'm positive about moving to level two is because health services uh, can increase. You know, people's um, people's heart conditions, uh, heart disease, diabetes didn't go away during COVID. And yet, uh, and yet uh, there's been a massive drop in the number of ED presentations and, the ma and a massive drop in the number of presentations to general practice for healthcare because people have taken that story, taken that message of staying home and staying in your bubble. And also I hear of stories where people don't feel they wanna be a burden on the health system when they see images of health being you know, under pressure as part of the, the, the COVID response. So that's another concern that I have. People still need their elective surgeries and now I've heard you know, the past week or so that, you know, we're way behind in terms of the number of diagnostic tests that need to be done in the outpatient setting, thinking about our immunizations, thinking about our podiatry services, thinking about our elective surgery lists, uh, you know, that, that's still waiting there. And so when you think about public health, it's not only about COVID, but thinking about both the, the, the wider health issues that, that are still um, present in the community. And one of the last things I'll mention is about the switch to, to virtual care and telehealth. There's been a massive change within how we provide healthcare because of COVID, not only in terms of protecting patients and whānau uh, from coming into the clinic, but also protecting the health workers too from being exposed to COVID. So within a matter of a day or two, um, healthcare, including general practice, switched to providing telehealth and virtual consultations uh, as part of that response. And, and my mahi is a clinical director at King Healthcare, which is a, a, a digital first primary care service um, that we're developing. Uh, we recognise about the role, you know, of some of the approaches that 
have been positive um, coming from COVID and we've heard about some of it, such as you know, the opportunities to work in different ways, the opportunities for collaboration that have come as a result, um, but also around the switch to, to telehealth and virtual consultations, which I see as a means around improving access um, to healthcare, improving convenience, being able to actually get seen in a timely manner and book an appointment. Uh, we've seen that within uh, both primary care general practice and also within uh, providing virtual consultations in the outpatient clinics within hospitals. And I think that that's something that's here to stay. And I think it can be, if implemented in the right way, be able to increase access, uh, particularly um, for communities, you know, where there's a lack of access to healthcare currently. Totally. Thank you so much for that, Kōrero. I think that's really, really valuable, and especially around improving access through telehealth. I think that's such a fantastic out-of-the-box idea, um, but really seems to deal with a lot of those equity issues that, that we've been talking about today. Um, Can I just those... say, before you move on, Marlon, yeah. sorry, and just Go on your point about the telehealth stuff, um, Dr. Vatsaroria, um, I was talking to, um, she's a local um, I don't know, tech Māori tech entrepreneur, um, Miriam Barbrich, and she was talking mm. about this um, this thing here called, I don't know if it's I Hono or I Hono, I don't know how that's being said, but it's this cool um, website that um, that she's been part of creating, which you, you probably know all about yeah. it. It helps yeah, um, Fano yeah. find their local um, providers, especially our rural Fano, help them find their local um, providers and stuff so it's quite interesting what stuff um you know our community is creating out of this whole situation mm. so i just wanted to share that before we moved on from that brilliant what an awesome example as well there you go free advertising for ihono <laughs> congratulations um going back to those equity issues um i think this is a really perfect segue into um asking a question to minister julianne genta um uh, because, of course, a lot of these equity issues are linked into um, the economy. And over the last couple of weeks um, at uh, Aotearoa Town Hall, we have talked about a caring economy um, and, and how work like parenting is undervalued and underpaid and homework as well and how whānau have been impacted during the lockdown. Um, I guess what, what we'd like to ask you, um, Minister, is how can the government build up uh, a, a caring economy, um, one that can strengthen public health and be a part of of, of the public health um, system? This is something I think about a lot, um, but I'll, I'll just preface my comments by saying that um, I'm very much going to be speaking as a Green MP right now and not a spokesperson for the government. Um, but look, the government has really tried, I think, to take into account this different paradigm, even from when you know we were first elected, the prime minister talked about um, recognizing um, in Aotearoa, where everyone is either earning, learning, caring, or volunteering. So not just focusing on the earning part, uh, which is mostly the part that we measure with GDP. But I think what we really saw, um, especially for those who had to stay home with kids who were no longer going to school, um, is just what um, incredible mahi is undertaken to look after our tamariki and to educate them. And that's a full-time job. And so for sole parents, uh, all the time, they're doing this, um, this incredible full-time job and having to support their whānau uh, financially. And um, the majority of sole parents are women, 84%. Um, and I think they would have found the time um, in lockdown particularly challenging, um, especially if they were expected to work from home. And I think, uh, just starting to look at the problem differently is what's needed in order to find the solution. And I think, you know, Esther and others have talked about um, policy solutions that I think are really widely recognized to be necessary to address some of the inequity in our society and to have a more productive, inclusive um, economy. But um, I guess my question is, how do we change the uh, political frame of it? Because certainly knowing that a policy is the right one to achieve your aims is not the same as uh, being able to implement it because so much of the political debate is framed in this old way of looking at things, which sort of says, you know, oh, the most important thing is the economy. Well, when we talk about the economy, we're just talking about commercial transactions. We're not talking about um, the work that we do for free or out of love, 
um, that underpins everything we do in the world of commercial transactions. There would be no economy if we didn't have healthy people, um, if we didn't have healthy children who were growing up with an ability to learn and to then be part of that economy and participate. And, and of course, we have no economy if we don't have a healthy environment, um, which means clean air, clean water, um, you know, soil that can grow nourishing food. Um, we need all of those things and we need to put those things first. And if we really value uh, the idea of equity of a world where um, people all have an opportunity to live a good life, then we have to do as what Esther says and start with uh, making sure that people have the basics. So, so our government, I think, you know, recognized um, some of this, some of the ways, the policies that I think are necessary to start recognizing the value of that caring work um, are you know extending paid parental leave but it's really just pretty small steps compared to what would be needed to really recognize it um, the way that other countries do um, another step would be significantly increasing the financial support to sole parents um, especially because so many sole parents might be trying to work three jobs um, on very low wages um, supporting uh, you know, the kind of employment environment where wages are rising at the bottom. And um, the Green Party put out um, some policy ideas on that not too long ago. Um, and I think overhauling our welfare system, absolutely critical. And at a time like this is a, the perfect opportunity for more New Zealanders to realize that genuinely, um, anyone can find themselves in a situation of not having an income. And that's what our social safety net is for. And everybody deserves the right to live in dignity. Uh, and so we need to get away from a politics that is kind of othering people who are in that situation and recognize that could be us. And we're all in this together. Um, we all have a responsibility and a privilege um, to benefit from the kind of public health system that we have here. And we should have a social safety net that genuinely enables people to live. We should have public housing that genuinely gives people choices. Um, so uh, I think that if, if we started to do some of those things, um, then we would genuinely be valuing the um, unpaid work and make sure that people have the basics of what they need, um, even when they aren't um, engaged in work that earns a salary, they're still doing things to give back to the community. They're doing important work and we need to support them to do that. Um, we also need to address uh, bias and systematic undervaluation, which you know I've talked about the gender pay gap and um, how that's affected um, female dominated industries. And the government has taken some steps there on the equal pay amendment bill to um, put in place a system that means that workers in these previously um, um, female dominated industries who've been discriminated against have a pathway to fair pay. Um, and I think, you know, that's a good start, but we have to do more because we have to recognize that the gender pay gap um, actually isn't as bad for uh, women uh, like me and, you know, potentially Susie, I don't know, <laughs> um, as it is for women with disabilities, as it is for Maori women, as it is for Pacifica women and other migrant women of color. So there's the intersecting ways in which people face barriers and discrimination need to be recognized. We need to shine a light on them. And then we need to put in place the specific things that are going to change that and make the world more equitable. And I think the, the thing that I've always thought would be a compelling political argument for this is we all benefit. We all benefit because we, I think, we want to live in a country um, where there is no poverty and no homelessness. And we want to live in a country where people have what they need and we all benefit from living in a country where people don't have these barriers. I mean, we will benefit, our hospitals will be less full if we address the housing problems. Um, and there will be more um, educated workers uh, who are able to participate in the economy if we support people and sole parents especially um, to, to raise children in an environment where they're well fed and, and they have opportunities. So 
I think I think we can all benefit from this moment, hopefully, of reflection when we go out there, you know, in level two, and hopefully we can stay at level two and just go down and not go back to level three or four. In our response to COVID-19, in that response to this economic shock, we have to start by putting our values first and not believing this, you know, rhetoric that's been around for my entire life that said, oh, we can't afford to do that. No, we can't afford public housing. We can't afford um, quality, well-insulated, heated houses. We can't afford to pay women what they're worth. We can't afford um, to support people when they're in need. We can't afford to have secure income support because people you know, won't go work. That's not true. None of that's true. We can absolutely, and in fact, we can't afford not to address these things. And we can't afford for our investment to um, be an infrastructure that is at the detriment of cl our climate. I mean, once we're through COVID-19, climate change is still there looming. And this is almost like a practice run. How, how can we work together to solve a collective problem? Because we have some even bigger ones coming down the road. Mm, absolutely. And and thank you for that corridor. And it, it does make me feel confident knowing that people like you are in positions of power to do some of these things. And, um, you know, just thinking about some of the work I've seen of your colleagues as well over the last few weeks, um, um, uh, Jan Logie's awesome work that she's doing around fair pay for um, those that on the front lines, as well as my, my colleague, Iona Pennett, who does a lot for single single person led Fano, uh, of which you just stated that I think it was 83% of those are wahine. So some really good insights. Thank you for that, Minister Genta. And I guess what, what you're talking about is, is all the different things that need to be done. But you know, it wouldn't be a town hall if we didn't talk about tetidity because that is really, I think, what's at the guts of all of this. You know, there's all these, this, this tinkering until we can actually get this, this foundational, I guess, constitution in a codified written form that actually entrenches and protects people's um, well-being and ability to live free from discrimination and harm in its many forms. And that's where we're going to Dr. Reese. This is your segue. I read an awesome article by you. Um, actually, recently, I should have read it at the start of the, of the uh, whole COVID situation, which is when you wrote this. But Dr. Reese has got an article called Why Equity for Māori Must Be Prioritised During the COVID-19 Response. But in your, in your part, I, your question for you, I, I, I wanted to touch on something that you said in that article, which was about the Ministry of Health's um, COVID response and how it was lacking in a treaty partnership approach. And in that article, you gave a few alternative models and, and alternative gov governance arrangements, which might mean that we had a more equitable um, response. So I wondered whether um, you would be keen to talk to us about what a treaty partnership approach might look like, um, and just generally, um, I guess, the, the importance of fertility and how, you know, we're, this whole corridor has been about all of these existing inequities, and it seems quite clear that we can only you know, even the playing field if we get that constitutional foundation. So keen to hear your corridor around that. And um, Dr. Matarodia, keen to hear your whakaro as well. Keen to hear everyone's whakaro. I think we all have a role to play um, in terms of implementation of tetiriti. So yes, take it away. Oh, kia ora. Um, I'm, I was pleased to hear from Julianne that she's here uh, primarily as a Green MP and, and not a um, Associate Minister maybe, because uh, I may be slightly critical of the government in my um, response to your question. Um, but I also just wanted to, before I do that, uh, just pick up on some of the other things, because I think it's been some amazing corridor just linking around the notion of equity, um, some radical ideas like, uh, you know, the fact that we might have no poverty or homelessness in our country, um, the fact that um, from Dr. Esther that, um, you know, people might have inherent worth beyond just being widgets in some capitalist dystopia, um, you know, uh, and, and I think these are really important things to hang on to because I think they, um, you know, once we start thinking about the level of values, then we start, you know, being able to critique some of the corridor that we've heard, um, for example, those criticising uh, our government as being as overreacting or wanting to rapidly open up the economy um, that really says something about whose lives we value and whose lives we don't. Um, so anyway, that's just a, a slight um, sideline. But um, I, I think in general for me, um, 
I mean, from one point of view, obviously the government has done a good job. And I, and I think key to that was uh, the aim of elimination. You know, that was really critical in, have it, in, in taking us on a different trajectory to what many other countries have uh, taken. And so, yeah, we have been able to avoid some of those really disastrous outcomes that we've seen in other countries. Um, and the government has had pretty strong support for, for the way it's handled the pandemic response. Um, but you know, from another perspective, I think we have to ask serious questions about whether the treaty is being honoured as part of that process. And um, you know, if you look at the public facing aspects of the pandemic response, which is largely what people like us get to see, um, you'd kind of, you know, you may be wondering where the other treaty partner is. Um, it, you know, um, it seems there's been a real lack of genuine Māori engagement in a lot of the different aspects of that and, and sort of central government, um, the people we see standing up at the, the one o'clock uh, briefings every day, um, you know, the, the civil servants and, and um, others, experts have been informing the government's response. Um, there's been obviously critique of uh, um, the um, Epidemic Response Committee and the level of Māori um, submitters and en engagement they've had as part of that committee. Um, even, you know, right down to the, the sort of voices that we often hear in the media, the, the, the whole partnership seems to be pretty uneven, uh, if you like. And um, so I, th I think what we've seen is that the core decisions have been made without real uh, authentic engagement and input and, you know, partnership and participation from um, iwi, hapu, Māori experts and communities, um, so, which is quite uh, concerning given that, you know, at one level, uh, Māori, Pacific, others are, are the most um, exposed to this, have the most to lose from the pandemic. Um, so I think what tends to happen, and I think this is kind of um, illustrative of, of what happens in a, a crisis situation is, um, all the, the nice to have stuff kind of falls off by the wayside and you're left with what's considered to be the core. And, and often that has, you know, defaulted to a fairly Eurocentric, um, you know, colonial approach to the, the whole pandemic. Um, and, and I think what that's led to is that a lot of the decisions, even though we have seen some really good outcomes so far, have really been made focusing on the needs and the aspirations and the priorities of, of middle New Zealand, I'd probably call it. Um, and, and I think people have been kind of assuming that what works for middle New Zealand will hopefully also work for Māori. I think that's, um, you know, wishful thinking <laughs> in the extreme. Um, so I think what really needs to happen is that we need to see Māori represented, having influence at, at all the decision-making tables, you know, at all different levels. But one thing I would say about that is it's not just, uh, that, that won't just be good for Māori, you know, um, it will actually benefit our country's response as a whole, it will, it will lead to better outcomes for everyone. And I think that goes to, um, for example, what Dr. Esther uh, was saying earlier, that um, it's about if we include the voices of, you know, those who are facing the multiple forms of oppression, um, we'll get better answers. You know, if, if you want to try and uh, identify and understand and try to address what the, the systemic barriers are, um, for example, um, Esther talked about transport. Um, you know, if you ask someone like me, I'm not going to be able to identify what the what the barriers might be, what the issues might be for disabled people, um, you know, or for other people who are facing different forms of, um, of um, discrimination or oppression. And so I think it's critical that, um, that we actually have all those voices at the table and influence in those, those decisions. Um, you know, if we can identify what those systemic issues are, those um, factors that are creating inequity, we'll help to solve those, not only for the people that are, um, you know, immediately facing those, but for everyone and help to um, help to make sure that, that the way we respond meets everyone's needs. Um, so I think in terms of what actually needs to be done, 
um, there's a there's a sort of a long term uh, strategy, which is about I think Tam mentioned uh, sort of constitutional transformation. You know, at one level, we can't really expect the government to uh, suddenly go from um, a fairly colonial way of operating to in the middle of a public health crisis, uh, suddenly doing things in a treaty compliant way. Um, for that, I think, yeah, we, we've we seen some um, examples of how that could potentially happen through uh, the Constitutional Working Group, which came up with the Matiki Mai Aotearoa report, definitely recommend that. Um, and, and that really gives some examples as how to, of how government could really um, act differently and there could be different ways of engaging and acknowledging the different sort of spheres of action that we need. So from uh, rangatiratanga for Māori, kawanatanga on the Crown's part, but then also a way of engaging in a sort of a relational sphere as well. Uh, so I think those are the key uh, moves that we need long term, but in the short term, we can also do quite a lot within the, the existing structures that we've got. Um, you know, for example, the Ministry of Health, I think, is, is one of those agencies that hasn't been particularly uh, strong during the pandemic in terms of engagement with Māori. Um, perhaps we've had some Māori members on advisory committees and things like that, uh, technical advisory groups, uh, but nothing that you'd really call true sort of active participation partnership. And yet we have this uh, sort of almost a blueprint from um, the Waitangi Tribunal's Kopapa Health Inquiry as to what's needed for the health sector to engage in a way that is treaty compliant. So if the Ministry of Health just looked to that, implemented some of those uh, principles, ideas in the way in which it's engaging in the pandemic response, we'd likely see much better engagement with Māori and therefore much better decisions being made and, and much better advice being given to government. <clears throat> Kia ora. Any um, further, um, yeah, any further? For Kara on that, I think you, you nailed that. Sorry, sorry, Marlon. I think you, you nailed that and uh, lots of lots of total coming in from the comments as well. Um, did anyone else want to maybe just add anything onto that at all? Or Nope. I just want to say, um, I totally touched off what everything you're saying, Race. I think like, um, I mean, partly it's like, what do we, what do we need to do to deal with a crisis and who do we need to involve when we are trying to manage crisis, but it's actually mostly about, you know, how do we, how do we want to operate as a society generally and how do we make sure that, um, I mean, and I, and I totally agree, and I've been on many of those advisory groups and advisory panels and stuff like that, um, but you need to have kind of, you need to have real commitment from, um, not just from government, but from hot, like all of society to, um, to really kind of agree that we are gonna, we are gonna do things in society to benefit everyone, um, to create equity and um, justice. Um, and I think, Part of that is about um, part of that is about sort of like really confronting the attitudes that we have towards um, groups in society and to ourselves. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, making sure that we kind of genuinely, genuinely engage with all these voices as equal and um, you know, um, fundamental to our society and not as kind of those groups over there but um yeah it's the it's the fundamental um you know way of operating in society kia ora Esther. um julianne i saw you put your hand up to to jump oh, in i did think that um i mean i completely agree with the points that have been raised and i just wanted to maybe emphasize from my perspective that um, it's it's not enough for the people who are elected to have that desire for an inclusive process um, because we also have like quite a big machinery of institutions that are used to operating a certain way. And so I was just reflecting on, you know, when we, we can bring that idea to 
this role and say, look, we want we, we want a truly inclusive process, but then you've got a whole ministry that's maybe used to dealing with things in a certain way and you literally have to, um, you know, you're talking about trying to get thousands of people to do things differently than they have. And I think that takes time and, and um, I, I don't know, I guess I'm just reflecting. It's one of the, the frustrations for me is that it's not enough to, to want to do that. We actually need it. Um, from you know both the grassroots and from the top and then we also it's still going to take a really long time but i think having these querero is like the first you know it, it all helps and we have to keep doing that it's a um yeah i um, i was just actually another thing i was thinking which i meant to say before which is that um one of the really basic things we can do is make sure that all of the conversations that we're having about how we like society to be and what what solutions um, um, you know are available to us to um, work with is that we need to make sure that um, we're accessible and I know that we were talking about that earlier it's like that the intent of these um, these discussions are that it, it is really accessible and it's like talking to real people about real issues um, and I think that um, but just acknowledging that um how do we make all of these discussions inclusive to everyone so that everyone feels that they can participate in um discussions and um and i think it's really awesome that it's online because it it does provide access to a whole lot of people who can't as easily go out into their community to have these conversations but just like we have to think about the fact that um some people don't have access to the internet so how do we kind of there's, it's like having those voices also means enabling those voices to be heard um, and including things like making sure that the communication we do is accessible in all kinds of formats for people. So, you know, that um, um, we have captioning on um, um, videos, we have um, New Zealand Sign Language interpreters, and it's been really awesome to see how committed the government has been to ensuring um, that we've got um, interpreters and all of the press conferences and stuff like that. But we still, I still hear all these criticisms from the, you know, from the community being all like, oh, it's just tokenism or it's just um, distracting and that kind of thing. It's like, no, it's like a fundamental thing to be able to know um, what is happening during a crisis. But not just during a crisis like it's fundamental to be able to access these conversations and to participate because the more voices you have the better the conversation is going to be totally totally um S -S susie did you also want to i saw you put your hand up before <laughs> yeah i just wanted to reflect slightly on what's happening now around the world is a really quite awful experiment right where every country is sort of doing things differently every you know in many respects everyone's had the same evidence right people have been able to act on it at different times like i think italy were a little bit screwed because they you know they were one of the first countries outside of china which got hit really hard but you know everybody was watching italy scream do something before it's too late but countries did different things depending i guess on how they viewed the evidence, right? What what values that they were were you know was it the economy economy versus the people type thing or versus health, and so it's you know everybody wants to say now oh this country's one or that country's one. I mean that's clearly not true, and it's going to take a while for this to um, play out properly. But when it does, it is going to be so interesting to reflect on you know, was it uh, the economy versus health? What, you know, what were the things and what were the, what were the values that countries took? What were the approaches that worked um, in sort of the long, long term, uh, given that this is also a global economic crisis, right? I mean, that's been one of the things that I, has frustrated me. I'm not an economist, but it did seem to me like everybody was going to be screwed, not just New Zealand, right? So it seemed a very strange, everybody going on about, you can't do this or you can't do that because it'll affect our economy, thinking, well, you're not watching what's happening everywhere else. It's been very strange. 
but it's going to be this really, um, yeah, as I say, an awful experiment where we're going to get to see <laughs> in the long term what the different approaches were and how that's impacted and how and how countries come out of it and, and what changes they decide to make based on what they learned through this, this crisis. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be something that is going to occupy many scholars, I would imagine, for many years to come. Um, but I really hope that we all learn something from, from that, really, um, kind of for the better of everybody. Again, how we deal with some of the, um, as, as Julianne said, you know, we have huge number of uh, crises in our, on our horizon that we need to act now, but we're not. And so what this pandemic has done is just squished it into like three months, right? Saying, right, you've got to do this right now. And so can we then learn for, and how we would respond to the ones that are coming, what, you know, from how, how we've responded here and how different countries come out of it in different ways and what we can learn from that. I'll just very briefly say, I'm mindful of the time, but just following on from others comments and from Susie as well, is that uh, really, talking about fundamental change and following on from Julianne too, is that there's no time like now, there's no time like a, a pandemic response and thinking about we're moving out of the emergency response into the medium term COVID response. And like Susie says as well, is about you know looking at, at how we can be doing things differently in future. This is all new in some ways, although we've seen um, previous pandemics, but what I see in the community is that we don't wanna go back to working in our silos uh, we we want to harness the innovation that's been seen at, at the local level, and that's why I want to mihi to you know all the all the volunteers, all of the uh, central workers, all of the farm, all of the frontline health workers who have been such a, a backbone of of this COVID uh, response. And I certainly want to try and um, grow and build on um, the collaboration and the partnerships and the change that has come as a, as a result of the pandemic and now where we need to look to is how we can build on, how do we set up the structures, how do we set up the systems and how do we set up the incentives uh, to be able to build on some, uh, some of the good things that have come out, out of this COVID response. Kia ora. Did you want to add, oh no, everyone, I think that's everyone on that, on that, on that point. So um, unfortunately, we have reached the, the end of our evening. I know there were some questions in the comments that people really wanted to be answered, but unfortunately we all have to go, keep going and, and fighting the good fight. And I need to go call my koro because it's his birthday. Um, so <laughs> he actually had a heart attack on the day of lockdown. So that was very stressful. Um, anyway, um, I just, uh, before before we wrap up and before we do our, our final karakia for the evening, I just wanted to give a massive mihi to all of you um, panelists who have um, joined us tonight. I really enjoyed our corridor. I learned so much from, I guess, an inside the system perspective and, and, and outside the system perspectives and just bringing that all together. And I know our whānau watching from home really appreciated it uh, too. So ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Um, Marlon, do you have any uh, closing things you want to say? Um, yeah, just want to thank everybody again. It's been really fantastic and a real learning experience. Um, and, and just reflecting on, on, on Dr. Matarodia's last statement there, there's no time like now um, for these changes to, um, to, to happen. And I think that is, that is what I hope people walk away from this with as well. Um, so massive thank you to all the panelists, massive thank you to Tam for letting me host. It's been a lot of fun, a little co-host. Um, uh, massive thank you to my dog who's managed to be quiet up until right now. Um, and I will be back to host my own special about the um, living wage. Uh, and so with that in mind, most of all, thank you to all the healthcare workers. Um, and all the essential workers, um, uh, the ones that Julianne talked about at the start. Um, each and every single one of you deserve a living wage. So if you're watching, go tell your friends that that's what that, that is the fact, that is the truth. You deserve a living wage. You deserve to be paid for the awesome work you're doing. Thank you very much. I'm going to make sure my dog doesn't rip up the carpet. Well, that sounded a bit scary, that last um, growl. Um, yeah, so so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to all the whānau tuning in from home tonight. I hope you were able to take some some gems of, of knowledge and wisdom and take those away with you and to, you know, spread the cordial far and wide. Next week, our cordial is all about Fano, So we have a Fano kaupapa next week. So similar-ish to tonight, but more of, I guess, the, um, you know, the experiences of, of parenting, of, um, 
I don't know, raising a whānau, being somewhat a young person doing school during um, the lockdown, all of those perspectives will be shared um, on next Monday's Aotearoa Town Hall Kōrero, and I will be announcing some of those speakers for that soon on the page. Um, but generally, we have some really cool kōrero coming up um, outside of our main Monday slots as well. So we have one hui coming up, and it's all about water. And that's be um, that's going to be hosted by someone who is actually a returning guest, Karapuki Tapu Dentis, and um, as part of um, this really cool kind of urban water, but also uh, natural water source kind of fakaro that we've been working on down here in Wellington around the five tour process. So that will be awesome. So we have a water. Um, Town Hall coming up. We also have a climate change one coming up, which will be hosted by Sophie Hanford, who is a councillor out in Kapiti Coast, and she's one of the main, um, oh, sorry, she's also a Kapiti, Kapiti Coast District Councillor. And um, so that will be cool. And finally, we also have a special corridor coming up about constitutional transformation. So that will be awesome um, to really take a deep dive into that and what that looks like. We can talk about Matiki Mai, um, about how we put that into implementation. So there's lots of cool content. Um, coming up over the next few weeks. Um, but I think my main takeaway from tonight's quarter, apart from all of the different um, gems and wisdom and knowledge that we've accumulated is that um, Aotearoa Town Hall can do better ourselves too. So we um, will be on the lookout for funding so that we can make sure that all our videos are transcribed and look at um, getting a New Zealand Sign Language interpreter um, as well, because, you know, if it's, I, I read a Whakatoki a couple of years ago, well, not a Māori Whakatoki, but I think it was maybe Audre Lorde who said, um, that if it isn't accessible, then it isn't revolutionary. I think that's really, really important. Um, and if all of our whānau can't access this content, then there's no point because it's not going to change anything. So thank you, Dr. Esther, for the, the final time this evening. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of you for giving your time. I know you're really, you're, you're super busy right now. So from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of all the people watching right now, katoa. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody next Monday and um, keep an eye out on the page for more information about those upcoming panels. So I'm going to do our karakia to close us off and then we will be done for another Monday evening. So, minai tato. Unuhia, 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 ki te uru tapu nui. Kia wātia, kia mama, te ngākau, te tīnana, te wairua i te aratakata. Koe ara i rongo, whakairia ake kirunga, kia tīna. Tina, homie, who we are, Thank you, everybody. Uh, Komari. Uh,